Welcome back to the Blue Sofa Talks. I'm so excited to have our guest, uh, Abir Safa, with us today. Uh, she is the wonderful person behind this beautiful Quran. I'm just going to, I'm very sorry for touching it. Go for it. This is her Quran. It is wonderful. We are going to um, go through all of it. Uh, not all of it, but like, you know, we're going we're gonna to take a little sneak peek at it. Welcome to the Blue Sofa Talks. I'm your host, Fatima Al Zain. On this show, we aim to bring females and women from our community who will share their stories and experiences. This show is really about just getting comfortable, you know, sitting down, having our uh, TMJ coffee, and chatting about the important things, you know, the controversial things or just the things that really um, go through our minds. Abir is a dear friend, even though we've only met once or twice. This, this is, is our, our second, second meeting. Yeah. <laughs> it's so wonderful. Um, I interviewed you way back um, and we actually lived next door, but we missed each other. Yeah. So what a nice coincidence. It's been and an honor meeting you for the second time. You as well. Thank and I'm you. so excited to have you on here. Um, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and finally speak about something I'm so passionate about. Yeah. Bismillah. Bismillah. So <laughs> Go ahead. do you want to start? <laughs> you can start. I mean, you, you were a previous interviewer before. <laughs> yeah. So I think let me start from the beginning as to how this all happened. Mm -hmm. I think ever since I was younger, you know, I I remember attending a lecture at the Islamic Center of America. It was actually yeah. during the holy month of Ramadan. And one of the speakers that they had brought there was speaking about someone that he had saw in public. And she was a Christian sister and she had her Bible and it was like all marked. And mm -hmm. he just made the point that always stuck with me throughout these years about how much effort she put into understanding mm -hmm. her book, you know, the book mm -hmm. of their religion. And I always in the back of my mind had that thought as to why we don't as a community put so much effort into our own book, especially the Holy Quran that is so emphasized within our Islamic traditions. You know, yeah. it is the center of everything that we do. It's, you know, when we speak about the Ahlul Bayt, salam, everything they ever say always refers back to the Holy Quran. Mm -hmm. And it always never really sat right with me that when this holy month came, we sped through the reading of mm -hmm. the Holy Quran. And it was, you know, we divided it in such a very smart way, I would say, as to like reading a shazza a day, you know, subhanAllah, there's 30 days for mm -hmm. the most part in this holy month and there mm -hmm. are 30 ajza. So I feel like it's very convenient in that way. But I always um, used to feel like, what am I getting out of this? And yes, there's so much barakah mm -hmm. from reading the Holy Quran, even if we're not truly understanding it. But I think a lot of us Muslims, even if we do come from like Arab households, mm -hmm. Arabic is not our first language, yeah. you know? So it's not that, uh, it's not only that we're reading mm -hmm. very quickly and not retaining the information. A lot of us, if not majority of us, are reading and not understanding a word that we're saying. That's true. So that's when it really began um, where I said, you know what, I think I need to start reading the Holy Quran in a language that I can understand. There's a lot to dissect here, I think, from what you've um, gave us like a little overview of it. But mm -hmm. um, I think the first thing to look at is that language barrier and yeah. that barrier, like cultural barrier, mm -hmm. I think that is um, created within our uh, societies because our parents have the language of the Quran. They have that relationship with the Quran. Mm. They had the more traditional, I think, um, way of learning Islam that right. we didn't have. Mm. We had the more like social media way of, of learning Islam in this digital age that we live in. Um, you know, most times we'll have the Quran app. And you're mm. like, do you read the Quran? Yeah, I have the app. Right. You know? Yeah. And it's it's interesting because we've come to a time where you can't build that relationship, even when you're reading a normal book, you know? let alone the Quran. I mean, a normal book, you'll open it and you'll like highlight and you'll go through it and it's pages. Yeah. And when you're reading pages, it's so much more different than actually like just going through an app and scrolling, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's so funny, how we... sorry, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was an avid reader growing up mm -hmm. and I always used to annotate and highlight my books, you know, the, my, oh my favorite God, I used lines. to get yelled at for like 
Yeah. Oh, dog earring <laughs> books. Yeah. So it's something that I always used to do. And then one day I just thought, if I'm putting so much effort in trying mm-hmm. to retain like All the information, information. Yeah. why are we not doing this with the Holy Quran, the most important book? So how does someone overcome that language barrier and start to build that relationship without the fear of like making a mistake? Right. And brilliant question. And it's something that I always thought as well. I remember, Mm -hmm. you know, growing up when I did start reading the Holy Quran in English, I had someone tell me, why are you doing that? Like, Mm -hmm. why? what's the point of reading the Quran in English? Or when we would do, you know, Quran khatims, Mm -hmm. whenever someone would pass away, um, you know, some people would want to read it in English and then that's not something that people would allow yeah. or would encourage at all. So I think in order to build a relationship with the Holy Quran that will last a lifetime mm-hmm. because this is a lifetime journey, it's mm-hmm. not something that we can develop overnight. Mm-hmm. We have to read it in a language that we understand. Yeah. You can't start at square five when you haven't even stepped onto square one, mm-hmm. you know? And that first step is buying a quran a physical copy get rid of the app Mm -hmm. the app is only for referencing it's not for reading the quran every day through an app read the actual book build a relationship with it there's something different about holding it in your hands Mm -hmm. um yeah and read it in a language that you can understand i highly recommend the english translation by ali kuli karai okay we can never find a translation that will do the holy quran justice Mm -hmm. But this translation is by far one of the best translations. Mm -hmm. He translates it in a way where he still manages to preserve the style of the Arabic while it's still very comprehensive in English. So he doesn't uh, compromise the English language. And that's another thing because a lot of translations are very complex. Very. And and there is that other language barrier where you're like, it's like you're reading Shakespeare. Right, right. And also I've come across translations where they oversimplify it and they don't really capture the essence of the verse and they miss Mm -hmm. a very crucial part in the Mm -hmm. translation. So I highly recommend that translation. Mm -hmm. And it really made me appreciate the Quran for what it was. And I feel like after we take that step of finally reading the Quran in a language and understanding the contents of the Quran, then we can begin to slowly introduce Arabic vocabulary, Mm -hmm. ask questions Mm -hmm. in Arabic, um, and try to build our Arabic then but i think it's 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 not very useful to wait until we're pros in arabic Mm -hmm. before we delve into the quran yeah because arabic especially if you're never gonna become a you're never going to be yeah you know up to par with the quranic arabic Mm -hmm. and it 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 will take many years of learning and arabic morphology and syntax is very hard and it's very difficult Mm -hmm. and it's it's something that's also a lifelong journey especially Mm -hmm. if it's not um, our first language yeah. yeah um how do we get over the cultural like you mentioned you know um someone telling you oh why are you even doing that don't bother mm-hmm. you know it's like when someone is trying to wear the hijab for the first time yeah. they're starting with that journey or they're starting to uh, maybe it's Shah Ramadan and they stop listening to music and they're trying to improve themselves slowly and everyone's like what's the point mm-hmm. Why are you even trying? Right. Like you have to go to that image of perfection in their minds right away, yeah. you know? Um, and you can't do that, especially when you're reading the Quran because you have to start somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. So what is your advice for, uh, you know, not just for youth who are going through this, but also for community members who do give this kind of um, that, yeah. so, <laughs> backhanded comment? <laughs> it's hard. Mm-hmm. I think especially when you're trying to put in so much effort into being better and gaining Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. Yeah. And you hear these comments, not from strangers or people outside of the faith who you expect not to understand, but it's mm-hmm. from people within the faith, within our sect, who are saying such hurtful things. It re- yeah. It's really discouraging, to be honest. But that's even more so another reason why we need to rely on the Quran. Mm. Because it's been one thing to learn the religion from people, and mm-hmm. it's been an entire different uh, journey learning the Quran from or learning our faith from the Quran from yeah. the source yeah. and that doesn't mean that you don't you know refer to scholars to understand the Quran but the way people practice mm-hmm. unfortunately the way Muslims practice is not what the Quran teaches yeah and we true. need to separate those two um, I think a lot of youth nowadays um, disassociate from religion stop going to the mosque mm-hmm. etc just because they had bad experiences and while I never want to um you know, say that what they went through, you know, I I never want to degrade what they have gone through. Mm -hmm. 
because we can have criticisms about the people in our community. And I think especially if they're people who have power and are discouraging people, um, I think that's something that needs to be addressed. But I, I highly recommend anyone who is going through that to go back to the Quran, yeah. go back to the source and understand it the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to understand it. Because unfortunately, Muslims are not perfect, but Islam is, the Quran mm -hmm. is, it's the verbatim word of God and there's mm -hmm. nothing like it. And I think all of these years when it's come to like spirituality and things, I always used to feel like I had something missing. Like yeah. no matter how much effort I would exert, there was always those criticisms. Mm -hmm. There's always that those thoughts in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. And when I finally made it a habit to read the Quran, and whenever I feel distressed or sad, you know, the first thing we want to do is, you know, go to a friend, speak about it, you know, spill yeah. our heart out. But before we do that, I highly suggest going to the Quran, opening it and reading. And there is going to be so much serenity and sakina and wisdom that overflows yeah. within you. And that is that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I believe it's a saying I heard so many years ago. It says, if you want to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pray. And if you want Allah to speak to you, then read the Quran. And it mm -hmm. truly is that way. The Quran is a companion to get us through those really rough moments where people are ridiculing you for, you know, taking that step closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's so beautiful that the answers all come back to, you know, Allah's word. It really does. It's the center of everything. It's like the Kaaba of our existence. Yeah. That's how we need to look at the Quran. Like everything points back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's holy book. Everything that we ever need, all of the advice to live life is present in the Holy Quran. And I always say, um, you know, I, now in like in the genre mm -hmm. of books, those mm -hmm. self-help books are really yeah. popular. And don't get me wrong. I mean, there's so much that we can learn from them. Yeah. But the Quran is the best self-help self book. book. It truly <laughs> is. It truly is. And it should be like the number one selling book on self-help because mm -hmm. it, and I'll get back to like that point. Mm -hmm. There's my, one of my favorite verses. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll save well, that for the for that. <laughs> for that. But I just wanted to let everyone know Abid is a poet. Mm -hmm. Um, so if she does sound like a poet, she really is a poet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, she has beautiful poetry. Thank you. Um, did you get your inspiration for your poetry from the Quran? You know, that's that's really interesting that you say that. Not at first, mm -hmm. um, but in recent years, I want to say within the last year or so, a lot of my writing has been inspired by the Quran. I just find it so beautiful how mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you notice in almost every chapter mm -hmm. and almost within it like every other verse he uses parables so um, parables to explain to us what we should be doing and he they're very illustrious and they paint like a picture just like a story would paint a picture mm -hmm. just like a poem paints a picture mm -hmm. and I really appreciate that and I'm so grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <laughs> uses that uh, verbiage because I'm a very visual learner. Yeah. And just when he paints that picture, I start to understand. And subhanAllah, how... It's so interesting you say that you're a visual learner mm. through reading. Yeah, I know. You know? <laughs> no, honestly, because <laughs> usually when you say you're a visual learner, it's through like actually seeing, seeing images in front of you. Yeah. But then having those images portrayed for you and you imagine those images, mm. that's very interesting. Yeah. And I feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that that's how humans learn best. Mm -hmm. Because why else would it be so prevalent in imagination? Holy book? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, so Abir, can you tell us about your favorite verse in the Quran? Yes. It's actually in Surah Luqman. And it's not just one verse. Sorry. I couldn't mm -hmm. pick just one verse. Um, <laughs> That's understandable. It, it's, a, it's a cluster of verses. I believe it's from verse 12. Yeah, verse 12 to 19. Mm -hmm. And it's basically in Surah Luqman, and Luqman is giving advice to his son. Mm -hmm. Basically life advice, you know, we were talking about, yeah. you know, this being like a self-help book. Yeah. And he just speaks about basically everything. And he encompasses it within these few verses. And something that I've learned about the Quran is to, when we're reading the Holy Quran, mm -hmm. not to read it as if we're a third person, but as if this is being spoken directly to, to us. Mm -hmm. So it's not just Luqman giving advice to his son. Luqman is giving advice to, to us you. as well. Mm -hmm. And it's the most beautiful thing. Um, he speaks about what the greatest injustice is. Um, and he emphasizes our duties to our parents. Mm -hmm. And what's so beautiful is that, so for example, he says, uh, We have enjoined man concerning his parents 
his mother carried him through weakness upon weakness. Mm -hmm. And it's so beautiful because anyone who's very familiar with the uh, style of the Quran, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes something or repeats it, he's emphasizing it. Mm -hmm. So not only did he say we enjoin man concerning his parents, so we already know that parents are really important, yeah. but he emphasizes the, the duty of the mother mm -hmm. and how she carries man from weakness upon weakness. And as a mother, that really resonates with me mm -hmm. because, you know, I don't want to delve too deep into motherhood right now because of <laughs> what we're talking about. But, you know, we give up a lot. We yeah. give up a lot. And I feel like um, from everything that we do in life, we get some sort of acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. But motherhood is that act of service and that worship that is very anonymous. Mm -hmm. No one sees a mother when she's awake in the middle of the night with her child. No one knows the pains that mothers go through. No one knows the spiritual uh, jihad that a mother has mm -hmm. to go through except mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he mentions it so beautifully in his Quran. And in a way, when I read this verse, I see and I feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I see you. Sees you. Mm -hmm. Even when no one else sees us, Allah sees us. And that has been my motivation through this whole really so crazy beautiful. journey of motherhood. You know, the uh, most memorable, one of the most memorable things that has been said to me in an interview was mm. actually um, the interview with you that I had um, way back yeah. when I um, was part of uh, another talk show. Um, and you said at the time, I was I was pregnant at the time mm. with my first son. And you said to me that motherhood is the journey closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. And that stuck with me since then until yeah. now. You know, it's something that I always think, okay, when I'm mad, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this. Through yeah. the patience that I'm going to have with this child, I'm going to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that really was something that resonated with me, yeah. um, you know, from you. So thank that. you for I mean, that. it's something that I know it, mm -hmm. but it's always something that I need to learn. Mm -hmm. Every day I wake up and I need to relearn that point. Yeah. Because to be honest, and I speak to so many mothers, you know. Um, a lot of my friends became new mothers recently and they all say the same thing. Like, how is taking care of your sick child, yeah. like worship? How is this spirituality, especially during this holy month, like month of Ramadan and in these days, we are so used to going to the mosque and, you know, reading the Quran and fasting and uh, participating in all of these extracurriculars that are worship. But there's nothing more that we can possibly be doing in this holy month than taking care of our kids in the way yeah. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us to. And yeah, it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like it's, it's a so spiritual act. It reminded me of um, this lady um, that I know who's the most like wonderful soul ever. Mm -hmm. um, and she had a child who was sick, yeah. right? And usually when people have a child who's sick, they see it as a burden. Maybe right. other people see it as a burden. But to her, it was her ibadah yeah. towards Allah. And when her daughter passed, the first thing she said was, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away his shafa from me. Like he took yeah. away what was going to get me into Jannah. Hmm. You know, like through her and through her khidmah for her, yeah. then she was going to get into Jannah. And it's so beautiful. And all, that's only something a mother would say. Yeah. Isn't that so insane? And there are so many hadith that narrate the status of mothers, uh, pregnant women and nursing mm -hmm. mothers. And he equates them to those who are on the front lines. Mm -hmm. And their status is like those who go and fight fi sabilillah in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we're in our homes. And I think that's something that it's been a fighting force, no pun intended. And it gives stay at home mom another home. Yeah, mom. I don't like to use stay yeah. at home mom. I like to use the word homemaker. Yeah. Because the mother is, she it's makes the, the home, she builds the home. Mm -hmm. And without us, like we are the pillars of the household. Mm -hmm. And without us, we there would be no household. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me the verse that most impacted you? Because I know that that verse would be different than your favorite verse, right? Yeah. So what was the verse that you read and went, wow, it um, like touched you in your soul? Yeah, it's actually in Surah Furqan. Mm -hmm. And it's, they say, Mufassirin say, it's a call that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu will potentially say on the Day of Judgment. That's one of the opinions. And he says, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّي إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا And the translation is, And the Apostle will say, O oh my Lord, indeed my people, consign this Qur'an to oblivion. Mm -hmm. And to me, especially during this holy month in which you know the Qur'an was revealed, yeah. and I think a lot about all that the Prophet went through. And he went through so much in his life just to give us this Quran. Mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala found him worthy to be an apostle, to reveal the message to him. 
and he went through so much he he sacrificed so much mm-hmm. just so we can have this just so it is it stays preserved through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace and mercy upon us and we don't even open it we don't even read it mm-hmm. we spend so much time on our phones and I'm guilty of this as well but how many times truly do we open the Quran for guidance for support for that spiritual nourishment that we need mm-hmm. to make it in this life every time I felt so upset I opened the Quran and it's been a whole different world. And, you know, there's that hadith I believe by Imam Sajjad mm-hmm. where he says, even if he was the last person on earth, and, but if he had the Quran, he would not feel lonely. Yeah. It's like, how do we get to that point mm-hmm. if we never read the Quran, if we mm-hmm. ignore all of the sacrifices that our Prophet, who we should be, who we should love more than we love our own children? Yeah. I, I truly feel like we've abandoned the Quran. We really have. And even in Surah Al Jum'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Mm-hmm. So he, again, it goes back to the parable yeah. of though he's speaking about the Jews at the time and how they abandoned the Torah, but we've like become them like them. We've become like them in that we have abandoned the Quran. And mm-hmm. it's it's a very scary thought yeah. because if the Prophet Muhammad will say that call on the Day of Judgment, do we really want to be like those people? who he says have abandoned his Quran. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a scary thought for me. It really mm-hmm. is. Um, how has your spiritual journey grown with your, um, like has, have you seen a linear growth with the more that you read the Quran, the more you became spiritual? Or was it more of a journey that you had to work on yourself? I feel like both mm-hmm. in the sense that when facing hardship prior you feel very alone Mm -hmm. but when you're facing hardship and the quran is your shield you Mm -hmm. don't feel alone Mm -hmm. and i think i think you can probably relate to this especially in your adulthood it's harder to make friends yeah especially if you move halfway across the world (laughs) or if you move countries you know we're in the same boat so i feel like adulthood for me has been very lonely or if you were someone who was you know like everyone else in the world during covid isolated right you know, right. Um, I, th- I think at one point, I think um, I was reading an article about how adulthood after college feels very lonely. Mm-hmm. And it's because up until that point, everyone's in hustle mode, you know, go, go, go. Once mm-hmm. I do this, then I go to college. Mm-hmm. Once I finish college, and you then know, you stop and you're like, what's the purpose? What's the purpose? Like, what did I do? Yeah. Where am I? Mm-hmm. So I feel like g- growing that relationship with the Quran just makes life less lonely, to be <laughs> honest. I'm like... I, I feel like no matter how many friends you have mm-hmm. or, you know, the obviously quality over quantity, but the Quran is that shield that we need. Yeah. You know, it's that driving force to get mm-hmm. us through. You know, when you're going through hardship, it's hard sometimes to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that this life is a test and that's all it is, mm-hmm. you are going to be rewarded for this, even though in the moment it feels like you're not. And just to be reminded of that, I mean, at the end of the day, we are what we eat. Mm-hmm. You know, everything that we consume on social media, and all of the mental health health crises that's happening, you know, they link it back to our usage of social media. Yeah. And we're in an era where we see what everyone else is constantly doing. And it really impacts our mental health mm-hmm. because, you know, we always feel like we're not doing enough. Yeah. Especially as mothers, I feel. Yeah. So going back to your question. And a more dangerous version would be you always feel like you should be doing what others are doing. Yeah. Especially when you're a youth and you're younger. Definitely. Definitely. And, you know, easily influenced. Yeah. And it, that allows us to not have our own opinions about things. Mm-hmm. And we kind of like become, you know, part of a herd, that mm-hmm. that very herd, like that herd mentality. Um, but I feel like one, spirituality is not like, you know, reading dua on a mountain yeah. with the wind blowing and it's like this serene thing, <laughs> as, as we both know, it's motherhood. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's not like, once you read the Quran and you become like disciplined and you're reading and reflecting over it, that you're just going to be like a, you know, like Shaykh Kabir, you know, or a perfect (laughs) Muslim. It's not that way. But at the very least, it makes life more bearable Mm -hmm. in in those moments of hardship and that you have a driving force and that you have, um, that you feel like Allah is with you. I feel Mm -hmm. like I speak to some people who say that um, when they're going through hardship, they very, they struggle deeply Mm. to feel Allah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's because we don't have the Quran relationship. Yeah. Again, if you want Allah to speak to you, 
read the Quran, reflect over it. So if someone is trying to um, get closer to their to their deen, of mm-hmm. course, the first step is prayer. Yeah. Right. So how do they get closer to prayer and the Quran? Right. Right. I mean, we're still working on that on our yeah. uh, our side, our end. And it's again, it's not overnight. Mm-hmm. I think we think that, you know, OK, fine. If I put 40 days aside, I'm going to build this amazing habit and then I'm mm-hmm. going to be this perfect Muslim or after the holy month of Ramadan, you know, because I've been fasting and praying and going to the mosque, especially during Laylatul Qadr, um, you know, that I'm just going to have it. You're, mm-hmm. you're going to have the it factor. Yeah. But Islam is about discipline. And the whole point of Salah and reading the Quran, you can't attain those things and really relish in the fruits that they hold without understanding that this is a point of discipline. Yeah. And it's a point of building a relationship. It's not about having a relationship you it's know, not you about to i'm gonna it. give you salah so you have to give me whatever i want right right, right? and which is what I think, most people yeah and i treat think it as even like in this, i pray so why isn't allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving me what i want we're very me-centric yeah. so like even when we say for example that okay well today i'm going to pray all of my prayers on time so i can be a better muslim mm. i think maybe we should instead of saying that and thinking all about me um say i want to pray my prayers on time or focus more on my prayers so I can grow closer to Allah. Mm-hmm. So I can know Allah. So I can feel Allah. So I can build that relationship. It's not about you being a better Muslim. Because a good Muslim won't think they're a better Muslim. Yeah. No matter what you do, it's a never-ending cycle of yeah. growth. So I feel like, you know, the end-all be-all is reaching God. Yeah. No matter what that looks like mm-hmm. in terms of reading the Quran or, or praying, you know, he gives us our holy book. It goes back to the holy book. He tells us exactly what we need to do in order to feel him and in order to feel close to him. And it's it's all written, plain and simple. So what advice do you have for people who are trying to start reading the Quran, you know, the Shah Ramadan? Um, is there a way that they can start reading? Is there a way to keep track of what they're doing? Um, how can they uh, not do like the Ajza? Because I think the, when you're reading Ajza, you're overwhelmed. Yeah. You know, you're like, okay, when is it? going to end sometimes you know like right. how many more pages do i have yeah you it, know it, it's, it's like a, it's, it becomes a countdown yeah um not something that we really enjoy exactly. or indulge in so how do you how how do how can someone make it more something that is feasible that doesn't consume their right. day you know yeah i mean let, we have to be realistic right right so first and foremost like we said i highly recommend purchasing a quran get your pens and highlighters mm-hmm. and just begin Begin from anywhere. If you don't want to read it chronologically, don't do that. Read it from Surah Yasin or read it from the end to the beginning. Or one that you're familiar with. Or one where you're familiar with. But make it a habit at least every day Mm -hmm. to just open and read, but not with the intention of, okay, I need to read one page today or I need Mm -hmm. to read two pages. Read one verse and just ponder over it. And I highly suggest doing this in the morning. So maybe after your Fajr prayers. So that way you reflect over the verse throughout your entire day. Mm. There's so much, even if you're like a busy mom and you don't have time to do these like uh, adhiyah during Shah mm-hmm. Ramadan, just read one verse yeah. and think about it throughout your day as you're taking care of your kids, as you're going to work, as you're in the office all day, and it will revolutionize your life. Mm-hmm. And it's going to take a few years to finish the Quran from cover to cover when you're reflecting over it, but it's, it's doable. And I highly recommend someone to, you know, I said I'm a very visual learner mm-hmm. and I know it looks pretty or whatever, but I don't do it for that. I really struggle to memorize, yeah. especially after having kids. You know? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so don't for me, I'm a, I know <laughs> I'm a very visual learner. Yeah. So highlighting and underlining and uh, writing question marks over verses I have questions about really made the biggest difference. Mm-hmm. But I also, uh, I sp- again, uh, more than one person has told me that they really struggle with reading the Quran. Mm-hmm. So I made this one year Quran reading plan and it's doable for the most busiest person on planet Earth. Amazing. And why I really like this is because you can finish the whole Quran in one year, less than technically. Um, but it's not just about reading through the Quran. Mm-hmm. It's about tadabbur al-Quran. Mm-hmm. So reflecting over the verses and how can and thinking about how you can apply the verses of the Quran into your daily life. Yeah. So we can have that spiritual reform and connect to the Quran and ultimately connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as we know, there are 365 days in mm-hmm. a year. That's the childbirth memory loss right. that we're having right there. I'm telling you. <laughs> 
Um, but this Quran reading plan, you're able to finish the Quran in 312 days. Amazing. Um, and it's if only, you're reading every day. If you're reading every day, it's a 20 verses a day. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, to read 20 verses of the Quran does not take more than five minutes. Mm -hmm. I've tried, tried and tested. It does not take more than five minutes. Mm -hmm. But the cool part about this plan is that there are 53 rest days. So okay. even if for some reason you can't read the Quran that day, maybe because you have work commitments or you've fallen ill, or even if you didn't read the Quran for 53 days consecutively, you would still be able to finish the finish entire it. Quran in a year. And I highly emphasize the 20 verses and not more, just so we can really think and, and comprehend on. about what we're reading mm -hmm. and actually applying it. And let me tell you, there's something so unique and uh, pleasurable and also um, enthralling about, you know, going to these lectures during Shah Ramadan mm -hmm. and the speaker references a verse from the Holy Quran and you remember reading that verse. I think a lot of times when speakers or scholars are talking about the Quran or they reference a verse in their uh, lectures, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, I didn't know that was in the Quran. Yeah. So I think we really need to reach a point where we know the Quran like the backs you of know. our hands. Mm -hmm. Where can uh, uh, people get the... I have a PDF available. Um, it's linked in my bio okay. on Instagram. On Instagram. What's your... Um, so it's at something about scripture. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank well, you. thank you so much, Javier, for joining uh, joining us this uh, month of Ramadan. Thank you for having me. And inshallah, um, this month is a month in which we can really develop inshallah. a consistent habit of reading the Quran and also reflecting over it. Inshallah. inshallah. And thank you to everyone for listening um, to our show today. If you want to support our work, uh, the Blue Sofa Talks appears monthly. Um, please like and subscribe. And we are here for you.